Even within those few types of trade, there are exceptions. For instance, by Ussalam. By Ussalam is buying, paying something and taking it later on. But there are certain types of, um, uh, of farming that the Prophet wasallam permitted by Ussalam. By Ussalam is buying, for instance, fruit that is still on the tree. You go to a farmer and you say, I want to buy those fruits when you harvest it and we'll take it. And Rasulullah initially prohibited by Ussalam. Why? Because there is a gharar. Gharar is uncertainty. It's not just any normal uncertainty. It's the kind of uncertainty that can lead, that, that is almost like gambling. Because there's so many uncertainties with fruit that are still on the tree. It may, it may be attacked by um, uh, pests. Um, there may be bad weather. There's so many reasons why you may not be able to sell it. But if you've already taken the money, what's going to happen to, to that? And this translates to uh, futures trading. Futures trading, for those of you in the finance market, I know MK is interested there, maybe a few others. Uh, futures is all about buying something in the future. You predict, you project the um, prices of oil three months down the road, or six months down the road, 12 months down the road. You buy it now and you take delivery sometime in the future. There, there, so there's, there, there is issues with futures, there are issues with it within the financial instrument, the derivative market with uh, options and so on. Um, there's a lot of discussion um, about this and you will see that a lot of the uh, financial crash that, is, that we see in recent times are basically because of uncontrolled leverage. Um, and um, leverage, there are certain types of trading where Rasulullah said it has to be yet and be yet. Um, these are gold, silver, certain types of crops that you want to exchange, it has to be yadan biyadin. Even though trade and taradin minkum, even though you are, you agree to it, you consent to it, and this is where, um, uh, find, uh, what do you call that, this uh, currency trading becomes problematic. Because currency trading, what do you do in currency trading? No one trades currency cash. Correct me if I'm wrong, but no one trades currency cash. Because the ma margin that you take, the pip, is actually less than one cent for, per movement. So if you don't leverage your investments or your trading, you, you, your profit margin will be minuscule, statistically insignificant. You may invest $1,000, your margin may be 10 cents. No one wants to do that. So every broker in, 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 in um, financial trading, in, in currency trading, will you, give you leverage. You put in a certain amount, you control a larger amount of money. And when you lose, you also lose a larger amount of money. So this leverage, is something that Rasulullah sallallahu prohibited. When it comes to currency, when it comes to gold, when it comes to silver, when it comes to um, dates, staple food, Sayyidina Bilal anhu, who was a poor Sahaba, he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa once and he presented the Prophet with high quality dates. And the Prophet knew that Bilal, he cannot afford high quality dates. He asked Bilal, how do you get high quality dates? And he said, I traded a larger amount of um, lower quality dates with high quality dates in the market. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is riba. This is usury. Um, and he, he told Bilal, if you wanted to trade that way, you have to sell the lower quality date in the market, take money and go and buy high quality date. But direct trading like that for certain types of certain items, the hadith is clear, I think six or seven items, the Prophet Muhammad may be able to help you here. But those items, especially with, with what is relevant to us today is, Gold, silver, currency. It has to be yadin bi yadin, and it has to be um, spot on the spot and without any leverage. You cannot pay now and take delivery later. You pay for you, you exchange for gold, gold for gold, and you say I'm going to take delivery later. You take exchange currency for currency, and you say I'm going to take delivery futures for currency. I'm going to take delivery in three months time. That is prohibited. But beyond those certain prohibitions, and you will see that. One of the reasons why such trading is prohibited, Imam Al Ghazali criticized money for the sake of making making money through money. Making money through money is criticized by Imam Al Ghazali, and you will see this in Islam. You will see that money is not wealth. Money is instrument of trade. Gold is not wealth. Gold is instrument of trade. This is why accumulation of gold you have to pay zakat. And if you count the zakat that you have to pay, let's say you have now the 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 this sort of goal is $8,000, so let's put it $10,000. You have to pay zakat on $10,000 worth of gold. It's 
whatever the increment of gold price, 2.5% per year you have to pay regardless whether it goes up or down, that, 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 that amount of gold, as soon as it hits the Nisab, $8,000 worth of gold for a year, you have to pay 2.5%. Over 10 years, that is 25% of zakat. It's hard to actually find um, a, a, an, an instrument that is going to give you more than 25% over 10 years. If you, I mean a stable instrument. A stable instrument that will give you that amount of return over 10 years. That means you have to beat anything below 25%, you're losing money. You have to at least, if you, if you make 30% over 10 years with gold, you're only making 5%, because 25% goes to zakat. Why does Islam institute such policies? Because Islam encourages people to trade, to do business, to build the economy. Hoarding gold doesn't help the economy. But when you invest in the community, in the market, you buy something from someone else, you build something for someone else, the exchange happened. And gold, silver, currency is not a, uh, it's not a measure of wealth. It is an instrument of exchange from the Islamic economic point of view. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a businessman before he became a prophet. And in the infinite wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jalla, he understood that the final prophet, he has to be a trader, he has to be a businessman, because the world that we're living in, in, in today is the drive driven by the finance world. The prophet before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Isa Alaihi Salam, he was a carpenter. Uh, then there's not much relevance between the trade of Prophet Isa and what most people do today. But if Allah sent Prophet Muhammad and made him a businessman, a trader before he became a prophet. So his job and the laws and the, 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 the rules that he put in place will be relevant to our world today until Qiyam. So Allah encourages us to trade, encourages business, put certain limitations, especially when it comes to speculation, when it comes to um, uh, riba, when it comes to uh, trade by force. So those things, income, you are happy with each other, you can trade with, 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 within certain situations. Now this is interesting, after business trading, Allah says don't kill yourself. Because we see a lot of people kill themselves because of losses in, in the finance world. We see just a few months ago, the crash of uh, cryptocurrencies. And many people just jump over buildings, kill themselves. A lot of people put everything they have in cryptocurrency. Now that's another ball, or that's another Pandora box altogether about the ruling of cryptocurrency with the, the, the level of war on someone. There are scholars who did a study, but there is no conclusive position with regards to um, uh, cryptocurrency as of yet. So Allah reminds us that no matter what you lose in your business, or you make in your business, don't kill yourself. Allah is most merciful towards you. If you have Allah, you can, you can rebuild whatever that you have lost. Yeah, there's always time to review whatever they have lost. And you look into some of the entrepreneurs uh, around the world. Some of them, I think uh, Colonel Sanders, the founder of KFC, he was 50 something when he started his uh, company. It's never too late to start LinkedIn. I can't remember the founder's name of LinkedIn. He was also in his 40s when he started his uh, company. You lose your money, you lose your investment in your 20s, in your 30s. And generally, in your 20s, in your 30s, you're a bit gung uh, This is why um, in one hadith, and Muhammad by Hafi narrated, um, this is, uh, the, the, the Salat is criticized, but it is narrated anyway. Part of the Hadith is Sahih, narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, but the whole long Hadith has a bit of criticism in the Hadith. Muhammad by Hafi narrated the Hadith anyway. He said, Shababu min shu'abu juhun. That, I translate, uh, youth is a part of uh, madness. Um, so when you're young, you, 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 you're big gung ho with your money, you lose money. I mean, I'm not telling you to just be dumb and put your money in the next new crypto scam. Uh, but what I'm saying is, if you lose money, don't kill yourself. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose hope. Um, because those who despair, uh, this despair is the, is, is the tool of shaitan. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنْفُسَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهَ كَرِمْكُمْ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ عُدْوَانًا وَظُلْمًا Those who kill themselves, do that, meaning killing themselves, عُدْوَانًا وَظُلْمًا with out of animosity, out of anger, disagreement. So now, wadulma. I, I love the placement of these two words, udwan and wadulma. Allah did not just say, "Wama yafal dalika." Allah put udwan and wadulma because when it comes to suicide, we don't know what is the state of the mind of that person. That person may have depression, clinical depression, may have bipolar that leads 
to suicide. So we are not to judge. We will say now, before someone kills themselves, we say that it is a major sin. The, the punishment for it is Jahannam. That is clear. But when someone's act, someone actually commits commit suicide, we don't pass that judgment on an individual. Because we don't know the state of mind of that person. We know it is haram to do it, but is that person in the right state of mind? Unwanan wa dhulma. Or is he doing it without him knowing what he is doing? You know, even in criminal in, in criminal law, we've got actus reus and mens rea. The action that is wrong, the wrong action, and the state of the mind of the offender. So is the state of the mind of the person committing suicide, does he know the consequences of what he is doing, or he doesn't have control of his faculties? If he doesn't have control of his faculties, then may Allah forgive him. And this sometimes in our society, we see this, I, I've not encountered it in Perth, but I've encountered it in some of the communities, where someone who commits suicide, the family struggles to find someone to arrange burial, the funeral. To do the ghusl, to do the kafan, to do the salah. They are, some people will say, Astaghfirullah al he committed suicide, he's going to enter Jahannam, what's the point of his doing ghusl? We don't know what is the state of the mind of this person. Allah put this, the, the cross there, Udwanan wa zulma, wrongfully, with animosity. It's not just a normal committing suicide. Somebody commits suicide, maybe out of um, clinical depression, out of bipolar, out of a, 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 a mental health uh, issue. But before someone kills himself, we say it's haram. Once it happens, we don't make ta'yin, we don't specify the ruling on that particular person. And soon we will burn him in the fire. And that thing, to do that, to burn someone in fire, is something that is easy for Allah. In tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tudhawna anhu kafir antum sayyatikum wa nudkhilkum mulkhalan karima. If you stay away from kabair, the major sins in Islam, if you stay away from the major sins, that has been prohibited for you, Allah would forgive, Allah would cover all your sins. Now, the word kafar, kafir, kafara, uh, literally means to cover. It doesn't mean to disbelieve. So when we talk about kafir in the technical sense of someone who disbelieves in Allah, it means that he knows the truth and chooses to cover it. He has been given the truth, he chooses to cover it. That is why he is called a kafir. A kafir means literally a farmer. So you find in Surah, Surah Al-Fatih, surah al the end of the ayah, يُعْجِبُنْ يُعْجِبُنْ kufara نَبَاتُ يُعْجِبُنْ kufara نَبَاتُ So the kufar is amazed by his Farm. It doesn't mean here kufar, the kafir, it means the farmer is amazed by the farm that is growing beautifully. And that, so, so the phrase kafir has a literal and a technical sense. Not knowing this, sometimes reading the Quran can be a bit confusing. So when Allah says here, Allah nukafir ankum sayyatikum, Allah will cover all your sins, forgive all your sins. And He will cause you to enter an honorable place. This is so the question is should we call our neighbors that do not know anything about Islam are they kafir? So you have the Quranic kafir and you have the legal kafir. Again, a technical meaning will depend on field, the field of study. In terms of fiqh, yes, you're a kafir. Fiqh has two dis- divisions. You're a Muslim, you're a Munafiq. Eh, sorry, Kafir. The Munafiq is a state of heart that Allah will judge. But from the legal perspective, you're either a Muslim or you're a Kafir. But the Quranic perspective, when Allah mentioned the Kafir, the punishment, وَعَذِبْهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا شَدِيدًا and so on, that is not something that we can do ta'yeen individual on a particular person. So this is something that we have to thread very carefully. It doesn't mean when someone dies, your office mates die, your neighbor dies, you go and say, that person is going to Jahannam. Because you don't know the state of mind of that person at the very last moment, Allah is between him and Allah. We will make general statement that people who hold on to these belief enter Jahannam. But that person, Allah, we leave it to Allah. But that doesn't mean we make dua of rahmah and of maghfirah for this person. Allah maghfirah, no. Allah Allah that dua of Rafa is only reserved for people who die as Muslims that we know. That things between him and Allah, that is between him and Allah. But people who die not as Muslims, 
We don't make dua of Rafa, we don't make dua of Rahmah. You can make dua for the person when he is alive. You can make dua for your neighbor. Allahumma barik lahu, Allahumma dihi, and those kind of things. You can make dua for, for him. And this is something that I think we have, we have to uh, bring this concept of Islam and interest in Islam within our neighborhood. Just throw it to your neighbor sometimes, you know. Uh, my neighbor, this uh, opposite the, the, my house, we're quite close. He, he saw my car, so he came to the car, just this just, just stuff. And he was saying that, uh, how's the cafe and so on. Uh, and I said, and then uh, I was, was saying, like, how do you still serve food in Ramadan? Um, no food? Yeah, so you haven't eaten anything? He said, no, 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 no. Surely you've done something. So no, no, no water. But you're making coffee. No coffee. No, no coffee. No juice. No juice. No beer. And I said, nah. Beer is all the way around. That's not just in Ramadan. He's been trying that every single year. Every year he'll come like, you sure no? He cannot handle someone living without beer. How is I just telling him? I said his name because he can't drink any liquor due to health reasons. And I said, wait. You're not drinking anyway. You're half Muslim already. Come, join us. You know, like, get healthier, stop everything else, no pork, you know, your doctors don't like it anyway. Just, you're halfway there. Come. I say, yeah, yeah, I'll think about it maybe one day. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm not saying that we, we, we just throw the idea into them, you know, in a joking manner, lightly, over the past five, six years, we've been doing that. Actually, why didn't we do our prayer? He wanted to come once, but uh, couldn't because he got a medical appointment. Is, is curious. A lot of a lot of people around us don't know about Islam because we're not speaking up. Uh, they're curious, like how is it that how is it possible that someone can go without food and water from uh, dawn to dusk? And now he's working, making food every day, making coffee every day, and he's still not drinking. Well, yeah, yeah, you, get, you get used to it. A uh, customer walked in the restaurant this morning, also asking about you. Sure, you can't, you, you can't take coffee. You can't take coffee the entire day. You're making coffee. I said, yeah. How do you do that? I said, um, I control the food, not the food control me. So that's the whole idea behind Ramadan in a nutshell. I was like, oh, this is amazing. So I think those conversations, normalization of Islamic practices, you're in, 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 a, in an office, I think, that is an amazing environment for you to introduce Islam. Speak up, I need to pray. It's time for me to do my the whole prayer. It's time for me to do my Asal prayer. They might want, be wondering, like, how many times do these people pray? Like some of my friends, they go like, five times a, a day you pray. When do you find time to do work? And they're like, um, it's just five minutes. We can do maybe seven, eight minutes. And that's it. You take your city break, it's longer than my prayer break. So normalize and introduce Islam. Because like it or not, the way we lead our life is a very healthy, a very healthy way of living, uh, of, of lifestyle. Uh, Harvard published a study back in 2015, I think, about the benefit of meditation. Uh, a friend of mine turned that into a business. So he's teaching meditation to Forbes 500, uh, the, the Fortune 500 uh, com companies in Fortune 500 country, uh, companies in, in America. It's my Malaysian now living there. Uh, but the study said that if people that meditate 17 minutes a day are happier than everyone else. And if you count the number of prayers that we do, we've got 17 raka'at a day. So even if you're at your laziest point, you pray one minute per raka'at, and you focus, you are talking to Allah, you're not doing your spreadsheet in your mind, you're not doing going through your grocery list in your mind while you are praying. You should be, Muslims should be the happiest people uh, in the world, that we got this uh, mental health, mental resilience, because we pray every time. And in Ramadan, we should be even happier. We, we have no time to um, so. Now, from this ayah, we also know in Tajdanibu Kabaira, Allah says that stay away from the haram sins. This is where we develop that Qawaid uh, the, the um, fit, fit maxim, that to abstain from haram is taken precedent over uh, doing something that is good. Um, what is it in Arabic? Um, to stop something that is haram, something that is evil, takes precedent over doing something that is good. Presented with two choices, stopping a harm, doing something good, you choose to stop the harm thing over doing something good. Because in this ayah, Allah says, the priority is to start, try and stay away from the haram things. And when we are making tawbah, turning towards Allah, we should make that as our priority. That we try
try and stop the haram things before we add on sunnah things. Before we add on our sunnah prayer, we add on our adhkar, our Quran, look into our daily habits. What are the haram things that we are doing? Take that out first before adding something good into it. Insha'Allah, we continue tomorrow. I will do the same thing. 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 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط